In this video, I'm going to show you how to conduct an independent sample t-test in R. Now, for those of you who are literally only interested in the t-test command in R, I'll make a note in the video so that you can jump to that section. I'm going to do more than that in this video. I'm basically going to show you how to test the null hypothesis that two independent group means are equal. And that requires testing assumptions, such as normality, as well as homogeneity of variance, for example. And there's also the requirement of estimating effect size if you're testing the difference between two means. Now lastly, I'm going to be following the commands in a text file that I've created to actually execute this analysis. And there's also a data file that corresponds to the analysis that I'm going to show you how to do. And that's actually based on a study that was published by Brody et al. in 2004, where they looked at the difference between smokers and non-smokers in regional gray matter volume and density. I've simulated data for this example to correspond quite closely to the results associated with this study. So we'll be looking at 19 smokers and 17 non-smokers with respect to brain volume, which is a continuously scored variable. So this is the data file, brain volume, continuously scored, and group scored 1 and 2. And there's also a write-up associated with this analysis that I'm going to go through in another video to show you how to pick out the results in the R analysis and then write up a report that would be publication quality. Now I'm going to package all three of those documents, the R commands, the data file, and the write-up, all in a folder. And you can get access to that if you buy me a coffee on a Buy Me a Coffee website that I'll put a link in the description. Otherwise, if you don't want to purchase these documents, that's totally fine. You'll get a lot out of checking out this video, especially if you're used to using something like SPSS, because I'm going to be making reference to SPSS a couple of times in this video for people who are more accustomed to using that sort of program. So the first thing to do, I think, is to make sure that you have objects removed from memory in R. So I've got step one here. If required, remove all objects from memory. You might have something in R, if you've been doing other things, that could potentially ruin your analysis because R thinks you're referencing something else. So I've literally just opened R, so there's actually nothing for me to remove. But if you did this analysis and you were getting different results to what I'm getting, put RM list equal LS close parentheses and then click enter and it'll remove nearly everything in the memory of R. It depends exactly how you named your objects, but for the most part it will remove it. So the first step after that is to actually get the data file. I just prefer this command here, which is the read.csv file, because the data are actually in a CSV file. This is basically an Excel file, and I want to get that on my hard drive. So I'm going to copy and paste this and put it into R. And what R does is it opens up a little window. And I can just look through my operating system through the graphical user interface and actually find the data file. And it happens to be this CSV file. And I just double click on that. And then R reads that data file into its memory. And so now I've called this data file data. That's what it's called over here, data. And if I type data, I actually get the values associated with the data file. So now I've got frontal volume with all those values there. And then I get the ones and the twos demarcating the groups. Now R is not good at dealing with value labels. That's one of the limitations of R, I would say. So you have to create, you don't have to, there are some other options. Whether they're the best options or not is debatable. What I prefer to do in this context in order to get labels associated with my analysis, because I'm not going to be able to remember what is one and what is two. Are these the smokers and are these the non-smokers? I won't be able to remember that throughout the analysis. And so if I just copy and paste this factor command and create a group labeled variable, so I'm literally going to change this grouping variable into a new variable called group label. And with group labeled, I'll be able to do analyses and know what group is what. So we can see here that there are two groups. One group has numeric values of 1, and the other one is 2. And that is showing up here, 1 and 2. And so R is being specified to allocate the label non-smoker to group 1 and smoker to group 2. When you use the factor command, you have to have at least one as a value. You can't have zero. So here I'm going to copy this so that I can get a new variable. So I just literally copy and paste. 
And now if I type data to get my data file, I've got a new variable called group labeled. And this will allow me to get results that are labeled non-smoker and smoker. Imagine if you had even larger group numbers, it would be much more difficult. So this is one way to deal with the fact that R doesn't have value labels built into its base commands. So now we get to descriptive statistics. And you want to look at descriptive statistics because, first of all, you just need them, means and standard deviations. But you also want to look at skew and kurtosis. And for those of you familiar with other videos on this channel, I've mentioned that skew of absolute values of two or less and kurtosis absolute values of nine or less suggest that your data are sufficiently normally distributed for conducting an independent sample t-test. Now in the write-up I actually give you a reference to help back you up on that and that's from Schmieder Ziegler et al. 2010. Uh, they're the ones that I'm relying on. To be honest there are other papers that find very similar results. Surprisingly, R does not have a base function to estimate skew and kurtosis. I find that really baffling. You can do more complicated analyses than that in the base of R. You can calculate mean and standard deviation in the base of R, but there's just no skew and kurtosis. So what I've done is I've created a function that estimates adjusted Fisher-Pearson skewness coefficient and the excess sample Pearson kurtosis. Now I've chosen these two and there are various versions of skew and kurtosis out there. I've chosen these two because these correspond to what SPSS does. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that SPSS is the best way to calculate skew and kurtosis, but I actually do think the way it does do it is a pretty good way to do it. And so in order to be consistent with what I've done in the past in SPSS and what I'm doing in R, I've created the function so that I'm within the same analyses of skew and kurtosis. And so what you have to do is you need to copy and paste these commands and literally just paste it into R, click enter, and then I'm going to specify my variable, my dependent variable. So I'm saying my variables that I'm interested in are the dependent variable, and in this case here, it's frontal volume. Now in your case, it might be something different. This is where you'd have to specify your dependent variable. For me, it's frontal volume, and I know that's true because it's frontal volume in my Excel file, and it's also true based on the results that I got up here. So frontal volume is the dependent variable and group is the independent variable. So now I'm going to copy and paste that to tell R that this is the variable I'm interested in when it comes to calculating the descriptive statistics. And then I'm going to use the sapply function to actually get those st descriptive statistics. And here they are. Now this is important. This is the mean 4.78 that is associated with the whole dependent variable collapsing across the two groups. Now you might want to report that in your study. Mostly you wouldn't be interested in that because you're interested in the difference between the means across the groups, not the whole sample. There could be some value in reporting it in some cases if you wanted to know what was the nature of your total sample. Now I mentioned something important here as well that I've got standard deviation here P which is the population standard deviation and I've also got the standard deviation of sample and the sample standard deviation is larger than the population and that will always be the case. Now in studies you would report standard deviation sample. It would be a very rare case where you'd report standard deviation population. The only reason that standard deviation population is here is because it's needed to calculate skew the way that I wanted to calculate skew, which is on the basis of the Fisher-Pearson skewness coefficient. It requires standard deviation population. You wouldn't report that in a report. You would report the sample-based standard deviation. So I just point that out so that you don't make a mistake there. Now, I mentioned already I want the descriptive statistics across the groups and to get that in R one way to do it is to use the aggregate command. So that's what I've got. Need to get the descriptive statistics across groups. So now I'm going to copy and paste this and importantly I've got group labeled here and so that's telling R that I want to use this variable not this variable because I want the labels associated with the analysis. And so, and this is also my data file specified here. So I've also specified data here. So that, those are important points that if you need to manipulate and you change the data file name to something, you'll have to change your data file 
name here in the command to something different. Data, data, because I called my data, data. If you call it something different, you'll have to change data across these commands. Just like you need to change frontal volume if your dependent variable is something different. Now here's my grouping variable, group labeled. And I'm calling dstats. This is actually the command here. This is the function dstats, descriptive statistics. So I'm making reference to that. So let's go here, copy and paste. And enter. And you can see that I've got my group, non-smoker, which is 1, and smoker, which is 2. And the sample size is 17 and 19 across smoker, non-smoker and smoker. And here are the means, 5.33 rounded and 4.30 rounded. So that's frontal volume means. This is suggesting there's a numerical difference in favor of non-smokers having a larger amount of gray matter volume than the smokers in the frontal lobes. Here are the standard deviations, but that's the population one. You don't really want to look at that. This is the standard deviation, S, and we've got 1.06 and 0.95. And here are those skew and kurtosis values that are going to be very similar to what you get in SPSS. And again, I've mentioned there are many different ways of calculating skew and kurtosis, and you will get different results based on those different ways. I'm showing you a way here to get skew and kurtosis in the same way that you would get for SPSS within about three decimal places. So the skew for the smoker and non-smoker groups are much less than 2 and 9 respectively. So the skew for the non-smoker is 0.11 and negative 0.56 for the smoker group. So much less than 2.0 absolute. And kurtosis is also very small, much less than 9. And so we have evidence to suggest that the independent sample t-test would be perfectly applicable in these data. So now I need to test the assumption of homogeneity of variance. Now most of you, or some of you, might be familiar with the test of homogeneity of variance that's called the Levine's test. The base of R doesn't allow you to do the Levine's test. What it has instead is the fligner colleen test. And that is a perfectly good test. In fact, it's more robust than the Levine's test when the data are non-normally distributed. So even though you might not be familiar with this test, I can have confidence it's actually a good test. So here I've got flinger.test and I've got my dependent variable, frontal volume, and I've got the tilde sign and group. Now I didn't need group labeled in this analysis because it doesn't really matter because it's not going to give me any results relevant to smoker, non-smoker. And then I spe specify data equals data. And if you had a different name for your data, then you would have to change your data variable here. So I just copy and paste this, copy. And here is the fligner colleen test. And we can see that it's a chi-square based test. The chi-square value is very small, 0.13, with degrees of freedom of 1. And the p-value is 0.715. Now, because this p-value is greater than 0.05, it suggests that the variances, or the standard deviations, indirectly, are not statistically significantly different from each other. And that's a good thing, because it simplifies the test of the difference between the means. I can just do a regular independent sample t-test, rather than something that needs to be more robust. So this p-value that's greater than 0.05 is quote-unquote a good thing, because it means that the variances are equal within sampling fluctuations. So now I can finally do the t-test. And this is the independent t-test command within the base of R. So t.test, and then open parentheses, formula equals dependent variable, frontal volume, tilde, group labeled. This time I do want the labeled groups because it will be giving me information. It actually gives me a little bit of descriptive statistics. And then my data are called data. You might question whether I should be calling data files data because data comes up pretty often as a specification in base commands. Maybe you should call it something different. And now here's something important. var equal equals true. If you don't specify this, R will assume that you want a different test, which is the robust test, which is the Welch's t-test. And I advise you not to use the Welch's t-test, which is the default in R, if your data are consistent with the homogeneity of variance assumption. And the reason is because the Welch's t-test, there's evidence to suggest that it's not as powerful as the regular independent sample t-test when the data are consistent with homogeneity of variance. The other reason to use it is that 
you're going to get decimal place degrees of freedom if you use the default t-test in R. So if you don't write var dot equal equal true, you're going to get degrees of freedom that are decimal placed and it might surprise people and they don't know why you did that. So I recommend that you do it this way. So just copy and paste. And here is the result, the two sample t-test, frontal volume by group labeled. The t value is equal to 3.09 and the degrees of freedom are 34 and it's a p equal 0 0.004 rounded. Therefore, the difference in the means that I observed here in favor of non-smokers having larger brain volumes, that null hypothesis of equal means has been rejected. So the mean of 5.33 is statistically significantly larger than the mean of 4.29 or 4.30, and that's p equal 0 0.003. So because it's less than 0 0.05, I declare a statistically significant result. Here are the confidence intervals associated with the mean difference, which actually isn't calculated as a point estimate for you. You'd actually have to calculate the mean difference. So 5.32 minus 4.30 is 1.0, and the 95% confidence interval associated with that point estimate of a difference of 1.02 is 0.35 to 1.74. And here are the means. And because I used the group labeled variable, it actually tells me mean and group non-smoker and mean and group smoker, 4.33, 4.30. That difference is statistically significant. So as I mentioned, I have a write-up here to include in a laboratory report with an error bar. You can't do that in R in the base. You'd have to have a package installed. And here are the references associated with my write-up. Again, I'm going to make a separate video pointing out how I wrote this up on the basis of the R results. And you can check that out. So again, I'm going to package up all these commands that have the steps for you telling you what they do. And I'm also going to include the data file and I'm also going to include the R write-up. And again, if you buy me a coffee, you can have it.